Part 2. This is a continuation of the story. The link to the first part is in the description of this video. Enjoy watching. What's going on? Every time a record is set, the angler has to buy a round for the house, kind of like when a golfer gets a hole in one. I didn't bring my purse. You couldn't buy anyway, you're a guest. In this case, the sponsor pays, and that would be me. Between you and your father, these trips are costing me a fortune. She downed two shots of brandy and disappeared into the back with chastity, coming out 30 minutes later in a club polo and freshly dyed jeans. Her catch was being played on a loop, and she got to relive it one more time. I tried to give chastity the tip she deserved, but she smiled and said, Miss French took care of it. I gave her a generous tip anyway. She was a college student with a small child trying to work her way through school. She surprised both of us by hugging me and then grinned. I have no right to ask, but I want an invitation to the wedding. What wedding? Yours and Pauline, of course. You make a very nice couple. It hasn't gotten that far, it might not. I do enjoy your company. If you say so. You have a good week, Mr. Holston. We got back to her parents' house, and I didn't park before her father burst out of the house. How did it go? Pauline giggled as she hugged her mother. I have video. We linked up to the large television in the den, and her father watched open-mouthed as the girl who had fought him for years cheered and celebrated catching the fish. When it was over, he couldn't get over the fish she had caught. I'm so angry with you right now. We could have been doing this together since you were young. She hugged him, kissed his cheek, and giggled. I'll make it up to you. Don't plan anything for after work or Monday. You're taking me to the sporting goods store to get me set up with everything I need. Next Saturday, we fish. He couldn't hide his emotions. Shouldn't you get your boyfriend to take you? No, this is a father-daughter trip 20 years in the making. I saw Monica tear up a little. Monica, next week you're with me. What? Let them have their playtime. I have something much better in mind for you. Saturday, 8 a.m. on the dot. Be ready. I turned to Rob. You wouldn't mind if I entertained your wife for a little while, would you? Monica went bright red, and it was all they could do not to laugh. Only if you promise to be gentle. Not a hair out of place when she gets home, sir. I give you my word. Well, all right then. We had a light dinner, and Pauline stood up. We're going to my apartment, and if you knock on my door before noon tomorrow, the place better be on fire. Understand? I know. I glowed, which made her parents smile. Pauline practically dragged me up the stairs. The apartment was easily 1,800 square feet and very tastefully decorated. I complimented her, and she grinned. Wait until you see the bedroom. With a month of built-up anticipation, we explored each other with enthusiasm. Pauline was expressive and responsive, and we spent the night together in a way that was deeply satisfying for both of us. When we finally settled, she asked, Where did you learn to do that? I smiled in the muted light. You've heard the expression around the world. I have literally been around the world, trying to pick up something new wherever I went. I thought that when I do settle down, I want to be the best partner I can be. Her voice was soft on my shoulder. A girl would be a fool to walk away from what you just did to me. And I'm proud to say my father didn't raise a fool. I know you don't love me right now, but you will before too much longer. I don't know. Maybe I need to play hard to get. That would keep you on your toes. I thought she was going to snuggle deeper when she accidentally bit me. Ow, oh, sorry honey. I'll try not to let that happen again. Good. You wouldn't look nearly as handsome without those cute ears. Sleep now, we'll continue this discussion in the morning. She was asleep in seconds, and I discovered she was a snorer. Thankfully, it was a cute, little rumbling sound, and I fell asleep listening to it. At 10 o'clock the next morning, there was a knock at the door. Pauline shot out of bed like she was fired from a cannon. I'm going to kill them. Maybe storming to the door naked wasn't the most thought-out course of action, and perhaps me charging after her naked wasn't a good idea either. When she yanked the door open, Monica got an unfiltered look at both of us before turning red with embarrassment. 
She then grinned and handed Pauline the tray she was carrying. Here, I thought you might need some nutrition. Carry on, children. Pauline, honey, it looks like you have a lot to work with. I think I experienced my first body flush ever while Pauline giggled hysterically. Thanks, Mom. I'll get back to work as soon as breakfast is over. After she closed the door, we just grinned at each other. Well, that was embarrassing. It'll make a great story down the line. And how many future mothers-in-law can tell her friends she knows everything about her son-in-law? I froze up. The wheels had just come off the tracks, and she could see it in my face. Don't get upset, honey. I should have said potential mother-in-law. Maybe I shouldn't have spoken so soon, but you're everything I'm looking for in a partner, strong, confident, not scared of my father or his wealth, someone who can keep me in check when I start to do something silly. And honey, I've done a lot of silly things in the past. I was looking for my clothes as I talked. We've known each other for a month. I don't even know how well I like you yet, much less if I could spend the rest of my life with you. I think power and affluence have gone to your head, Miss French. I'll be taking my leave now. Calm down, please stay. I think not. Have a pleasant day, Miss French. Rob called me to his office Monday morning. I ought to fire you. My daughter cried all weekend over you. Then he grinned. You never heard me say this, but good for you. Pauline has led men and boys around by their noses since she hit puberty. It's about time she experienced the feeling that you don't always get what you want. Aside from that, you've been really good for her. Even her mother commented on the different attitude. I myself think you have definite potential as a son-in-law. I'd sleep better after I retire if I knew you were by her side. That is not up to me, and I'll do my best to leave you two alone. I'll make sure Monica does the same, as hard as that will be. She's already thinking about redecorating a couple of bedrooms for children. Watch out, son, she's coming for you with all guns blazing. I only ask if it doesn't work out that you be decent about it. Noted, sir. Well then, carry on. Martin noticed my mood instantly. Trouble in paradise? If Miss French calls, take a message. Do not put her through. If she tells you she's coming down, give me enough warning so I can be out of the office. If you think I'm avoiding her, you're as perceptive as always. I'm not running from her. I'm just afraid if she pushes my buttons right now, she'll find the one that says detonate. She doesn't want that, and I don't want that either, because there would be no going back. I need a little time and space before I talk to her again. Her eyes widened. This was a side of me she'd never seen. I didn't raise my voice or say disparaging things, but she knew I meant every word. She grinned. Yes, sir. Boss, ain't love grand? I wouldn't know. If I ever find out, I'll describe it to you in excruciating detail. It may take days. She was smiling as she went back into her office. I heard the phone ring several times, and at lunch, she poked her head into the office. Lunch? I've learned your language, Marta. What you mean is you're hungry and want me to take you somewhere better than a pizza place. Let's go. She almost got into the car on the wrong side before remembering. If you kill me, can I have your car? Do you even know how to drive? No, but if I had this thing, I'd definitely learn, she said as she sank into the soft leather, fiddling with the controls until she had them just right. I'd found a little Creole restaurant while I was out, just driving around and familiarizing myself with my new home. It was small, with no decor, soft lighting, or fawning waiters. You walked up to the counter, read the list of what was available that day, and ordered. If you were eating there, an ancient waitress led you to a table, usually already occupied. The first time I went, I looked at the waitress, and she grinned. I ain't got the space to put one guy at a table. You eat where we set you. Are y'all getting it to go? I came to enjoy the random table mates, some in construction, some secretaries or cubicle drones, and others doctors, lawyers, or professionals. I played a game, if I was with the regular people, I'd let my Carolina accent come out. If it was a bunch of suits and ties, I sometimes used my English to impress them. I almost got banned once for bringing Carmel and Lizzie with me. They were dressed in jeans and cute tops, and almost makeup-free. 
they still turn heads, but no one recognized them, not too many fashionistas in a place like that. They went on and on about the food and even mentioned it on one of those fluff television shows as one of their favorite restaurants in their hometown. Business picked up until there was a line out the door by noon every day. Somehow, the owner found out I was responsible for their free advertising and thanked me while also scolding me. Since then, I usually got my orders to go. The owner grinned when she saw us and made a beeline to my table. You show up with another beautiful woman, yeah? Cher, you're going to kill me. She was laughing when she said it, and Marta surprised her by speaking to her in French, or rather, in Haitian Creole. I spoke fluent French, but the dialect made it hard to keep up. I think they would have still been talking if we hadn't had to go back to work. She said a few more things to Marta as we left, and Marta blushed a deep red. What did she say to you? Nothing serious. What could she say that could make me blush? Marta went quiet until we got to the parking lot. Just before we exited the car, she spoke. She says you're going to be my man. She said she had the sight and knew it to be true. Mona also said she was going to have her cousin work a spell and make a potion to make it happen. I thought about that for a second before I grinned. Well then, I'll be making the tea and coffee from now on. Wouldn't want any little something special added to the cream, would we? Her spirit was back, and she grinned. If I wanted you bad enough, I wouldn't need a potion. I'd have the keys to your heart before you knew there was a thief in the house. With that, she flounced back into the building, putting a little extra sway in her tiny but very well-defined hips. I followed, wondering if all this was really worth it. A couple of days went by, and I heard Marta in hushed conversation several times. On the third day, she walked into my office. Lunchtime. You're dining in Amaretto, and you're dining with a companion. Please do this and resolve things before it drives me crazy. I've talked to her three times, and she says she'll behave. If she doesn't, walk out. She turned and started out, stopping just before she went through the door. Remember, you're to be mine. She's just a placeholder until I can get your full attention. In case you're wondering, my love potion came. Did your coffee taste a little funny this morning? It was fine. But tell me something, how come I've never noticed your halo of stars and bluebirds before now? Her laugh floated through the door with a parting shot. Maybe you haven't been looking at me in the right light. Enjoy lunch. It was, in a word, tense. I stood when she came in and seated her. I was drinking a really nice tea, and she wanted wine. She started to talk, and I stopped her. Not now. After we're done with lunch, we'll talk. Let's not ruin a good meal. We ate mostly in silence, and when we were through, we settled down with coffee and another decadent dessert. Is it alright to talk now? If it is, let me apologize. I've always been intense, always gotten what I wanted, and it just never occurred to me you might object to the agenda. Therein lies the difference. Miss French. You've always gotten what you wanted until you didn't want it anymore. I'm well aware of your failed relationships, especially your two failed engagements. It may surprise you, but you're not as universally loved as you think. I had people lining up telling me to avoid you like the plague. I really think no one had spoken to her like that before. The shock was plain on her face, and tears were starting to trickle down her cheeks. The confusion when I took her hand and smiled was also evident. That being said, I find you enjoyable to be around, as long as the princess is kept in check. You're beautiful, mentally stimulating, and smoking hot in bed, all qualities I admire. Let me tell you about myself, first and foremost, I don't play games. You ask me what I think, and I'll tell you, even if you don't like it. Up until I took this job, my life was one long example of dramatics, and I'm happy to say it's behind me now. Now then, if you can stop planning the rest of my life and let things develop naturally, I'd like to see you again. You've been warned, Miss French, any game playing at all will result in a permanent split. And should we develop feelings and then you decide you'd like to take a better offer, you look me in the eye and tell me before you act on it. Do you understand? She wrapped her arms around me, and the smirk was back. I think I can safely say that will never happen. Let's go dancing Friday. I'd say Saturday, but thanks to what you did, I have to get up at 5 on Sunday so we can be on the streams at daylight. 
your father has had a grin on his face all week. I hope you give him the dream he's always wanted. She got really quiet for a minute. I don't think I'll ever forgive myself for not fishing with him when I was a child. Even if it doesn't live up to last week, we'll still have the memories. Good for you then. I'm sure you'll tell me all about it on Monday during our conference, in excruciating detail. I'll probably have pictures. Even better, she said with a smile when I got back to the office. I think Marta frowned a bit, but soon the smile was back. Over afternoon tea, she did a little teasing. Jason Jr. and Maria? I beg your pardon? Jason Jr. and Maria. Those are to be the names of our first two children. I had to wonder how serious she was taking this. The first two? How many are we going to have? We're going to have babies until you tell me to stop. I think four is a good number, but five is even better. I looked at Marta and smiled. She was barely five feet two inches tall and probably didn't weigh 100 pounds. The vision of her nine months pregnant was very pleasant. I can see the two. We'll negotiate the others. Her smile was dazzling. No, we won't. The only way we would stop would be if we stopped making love, and I know for a fact that after you sample this island goddess, that will never happen. Back to work. Your halo is getting bigger. She looked over her shoulder, grinning. I know. I gave you a second dose. Pauline picked the venue, a classic ballroom with an orchestra of at least 20. The atmosphere was perfect, muted lighting with small lamps on the tables. There was even a girl dressed in a short uniform walking around with a strap across her shoulders, holding a large tray. I hadn't noticed anyone smoking and grinned when she came to the table. Her tray was filled with fresh-cut flowers. I bought a red rose and put it in a vase that was on the table for just that purpose. I didn't ask the price, the place was upscale to the point that asking prices would have been bad form. I probably paid her twice what she would have normally gotten as a tip. Who came up with this? I asked. The girl couldn't be much past her teens, and her outfit was both sexy and demure at the same time. Mine, she said with a smile. My uncle owns the place and offered me a job as a waitress, but I pitched this idea and he loved it. He doesn't have to pay me, and I keep all the profits. I work Friday, Saturday, and Sunday and make more than many with regular jobs. It helps pay my college expenses. I hope you're pursuing a business degree. Marketing and small business, the girl replied as she moved away to another customer. By the end of the night, there were half a dozen roses on her table, and the young lady wrapped them for us to take home. As we left, we drank a little, one bottle of champagne between us. It was a good year. My mother was close friends with the owners. We spent most of the night dancing. The band had a good variety in their playbook, going from sedate waltzes to the jitterbug, the foxtrot, and other pieces. I knew most and we faked the rest, laughing as we made mistakes. They had a vocalist I thought was woefully underutilized. Her range and depth were something you didn't run across every day, and she got everything she could out of every song. At the end of the night, Pauline went home with me, and we made love, a gentler coupling than our last encounter. It was just as good, but different. She was responsive to everything we did. When we were done, she snuggled into me, crying lightly as she drifted off to sleep. Sometime in the middle of the night, the beast came roaring back, and I thought for a minute we might break the bed. But it seemed made of sturdy stuff and resisted all our efforts. We woke up as daylight streamed in, snuggled for a minute, then decided to shower together. It took two showers before we were clean. What would you like to do tonight? Sleep, I said with a grin. We both have to get up very early, so we're going to have to go to bed early. I'd like you to stay again tonight if that's alright. We'll have to run by your house sometime to get the stuff you'll need. And by going to bed early, I mean early. In that case, I vote we go to bed extra early, and not for sleep. Eight o'clock bedtime for us then. I was thinking maybe seven. We managed to miss her parents while she picked up her gear. She sent her father a text telling him she'd be up and waiting by six, and we were off. We goofed off all day going to a matinee movie and then window shopping at the high-end mall where the theater was located. She was looking through a window at something and smiling when the smile froze on her face. 
I looked around to see a man and woman with a small child, and the woman was very pregnant. Their eyes met and held for a second, then they looked away. When I got closer, it hit me who it was, Bob, her first fiancé, and his family. Earlier in the week, I had a visitor, it was Bob. I kind of remembered meeting him but couldn't place him. He introduced himself as Bob. Can I talk to you a minute? Marty got him a coffee and shut the door. He got right to the point. I don't know if you remember me. I'm the receiving manager here, but I just got a promotion. Effective next week, I'll be the receiving coordinator for all the plants. He seemed really proud, so I congratulated him. He thanked me and got to the point of his visit. I used to be engaged to your girlfriend. We were pretty close through the last of high school and most of college, but she was kind of flighty even back then. She'd be all over you for a week and then move on to someone else. The last time we were together, I thought she had grown up and we were making all kinds of plans. When she came back from a business trip, she told me she had found her soulmate and moved away to be with him. I'm sure you've heard the story of what happened then. I wasn't particularly keen on talking to you, but her father asked me to. He's a good man, and I'd do just about anything for him. But I'm uncomfortable with this. He shrugged. Maybe she's finally grown up. If you two get as serious as Rob seems to want, just be careful. She's a loving and wonderful woman when she wants to be. When she's not, well, she's just not. I wish you the best, but tread carefully and keep your eyes on her. That's probably not the best way to start a relationship, but it is what it is. Her track record isn't the greatest. I sat and thought for a while after he left. Everyone from her father on down seemed to have faith that she was going to hurt me if we continued. And now he was in front of us. Jason, Pauline, how are you? Jason, I don't think you've met my wife. He introduced his wife and child as he fondly touched her stomach. And this is Emma. When she decides to get here, I think it's going to be pretty soon. His wife giggled. He keeps saying that, but in reality, I have another six to eight weeks to go. If she's like our first, the time will seem like a year. They talked for just a second before leaving. Pauline had little to say, and when we stopped for coffee, I asked her about it. I was surprised at how honest she was. I was kind of in love with him for most of my teen years in college. When we finally got serious, I was the happiest woman in the world. We weren't that far from the wedding when I went on that business trip. When you get down to it, I think it was just pure lust taking over. When I met Jameson, he was pretty easy to talk to and built like a Greek god. I have a feeling that some part of me realized all he wanted from me was a roll in the hay, but I fell for it anyway. He was in my bed by the second day and didn't leave until it was time for me to go home. It came out later that his pregnant wife was on a trip, and that's how he had time to be with me. She took a moment, a tear rolling down her cheek. I'll never forget the look on Bob's face when I told him we were over. I think it was part sadness and part resignation. He once told me that deep down, he knew it was never going to last. That hurt, of course. When I got back and declared my love for Jameson, he panicked. Then he told me he was married and offered to put me in a love nest so I'd be available whenever he could slip away. I was mortified and deeply ashamed. I couldn't face going home to my father and seeing Bob's face when the story got out, so I found a job 100 miles farther north and stayed until Dad came and dragged me home. And there's the sad tale of what happened. What happened to Jameson? For the first time, she smiled, but it was not a pleasant one. When Daddy found out what I'd done with the man, he was furious. If you're a company, it's financial suicide to piss off your biggest customer. When his boss found out why, he lost his business. The guy was toast. Even though he lied to me, I asked dad to show a little mercy. The guy had a wife and two small children. He didn't totally destroy him, but he did set back his career by years. The last I heard, and this has been years ago, the wife is the main breadwinner now. They stayed together but she didn't trust him, and life has been pretty miserable for him. We all pay for lapses in judgment. I saw her flinch and took her hand. I wasn't speaking about you. There have been times in my past when I did things that, on reflection, weren't the most thought-out courses of action. Most normal people regret decisions they made in anger or pain, 
and there are a few instances when I would have loved to have a do-over. But in the real world, you live with your actions, be they good or bad. Then you try not to make those mistakes again. That was very well put, honey. There have been many times when I wished I'd done something differently. But if we're smart, we try not to repeat the bad decisions we've made. I could be the poster child for bad decisions. I just want you to know that I have learned and I don't want to look back on my mistakes. I prefer to look forward to my successes. And while I know you don't want to hear it yet, I'm going to count you as my greatest success. Proof that I beat the odds. Don't dwell on it, but I speak the truth. It was an impressive speech and almost had me convinced, but experience had taught me that time was the best judge of promises. We went home and were naked within minutes, exhausted by nine. As I held her, snuggled to me, I mused that life could be very pleasant with her. The alarm went off at 4.45, and Pauline groaned, slapped her phone, and rolled back over. She would have gone right back to sleep, but I jumped up, yanked the covers off her, and playfully swatted her well-formed hips. She jumped up with fire in her eyes and then grinned. Thanks, honey. I'm guessing you'll be the official getter upper in the family. Got the fly. She was showered and dressed in 20 minutes, her equipment gathered and in the trunk of her car. Wish me luck. You used up all your luck the first time you fished. People go their whole lives and never land a fish like you did your very first try. Have a good time. She grabbed my butt, gave me a nice kiss, and was gone. I showered and dressed, getting ready for my date. Monica was ready when I got there. We put her clubs in the trunk beside mine and were off. We had a 9 o'clock tea time, which gave us just enough time for a light breakfast before we hit the course. She hadn't golfed in almost a year. She loved it, but Rob would rather fish, and she thoroughly enjoyed the 18 holes. We paired up with a judge and his wife, and they became fast friends by the fourth green. Bonnie laughed as I bent over for a putt. I know who you're married to, Monica. Is this fine young man your boy toy? I wish, she said, enjoying the flinch. He looks absolutely delicious. Fortunately, I have hopes he'll end up as a son-in-law. I'm going to do everything in my power to make it so. They giggled, and then Bonnie looked at her husband. Well, if it doesn't work out, call me. We'll share. I missed my second putt and looked up, grinning. Hasn't anyone ever told you it's poor manners to talk while a person is concentrating on a putt? Perhaps you'd like to come over here so I can make better use of my mouth. As she said it, she licked her lips. Her husband was trying miserably not to laugh while Monica went red. Bonnie was 67, but she was a very well-preserved and attractive 67. I'd have guessed she was close to Monica's age, and she was 51. So that's the way it's going to be, I said. All right then, she replied. At the next tee, when she bent over, I whispered to Monica, who burst out laughing just as she swung. What the hell was that? Oh, Jason just observed that when you bent over to put your ball on the tee, you had a very nice rump and he wondered what it would look like with bite marks all over it. That's not true, Monica said. Nice bomb, not rump. The judge shanked his tee shot and pretended to glare at us. Do I have to issue a gag order here? And Jason, I can't tell you that her hips look very nice with teeth marks across them. I think I have pictures if you're interested. None of us scored particularly well, but we had more fun than anyone on the course. At the end of the round, the ladies went to freshen up, and the judge grinned at me. You know, I watched you play once on television. It was that Pro-Am Invitational in the Cayman three years ago, some sort of tie-in with a modeling event, if I remember correctly. You and your partner came in second, losing by two strokes to the best golfer in the world at the time. Care for a serious round after lunch? You of all people know the course is booked months in advance, and it will be impossible to get an opportunity to play this afternoon. Besides, the only reason we came in second is because my partner was the number one female golfer at the time. He just grinned and called a couple of men from two tables over, asking if they'd like to make it a foursome. Besides being a judge, he was also the president of the board of directors for the club, so there was absolutely zero chance they would refuse. We enjoyed a nice lunch, and I grinned at Monica. This is where we part ways. If you would follow this nice young lady, she'll tell you what you're going to do for the next few hours. 
I'll be back to pick you up at 4.30. I didn't give her a chance to say anything, getting up and leaving her in the hands of her personal attendant. She was to be given every service the spa offered while I golfed with the judge. I managed to get his wife included at the last minute, warning her that I better not hear about any fresh bite marks when she was through. I could hear their voices getting louder and more animated as we left. These guys were serious golfers, very low handicaps, and completely immersed in the game. We chatted some on the first nine, but it got serious on the turn. Jay and Derek grinned. Usual terms. Absolutely. He turned to me so they couldn't see the smirk on his face. We play for $100 a hole, two teams, no captain's choice. You play your ball where it falls. They beat us the first two holes before we hit our stride. Between us, we had three birdies, three pars, and a hole in one, winning six of the holes and $300 a piece. The last hole was a par three, 120 yards from the box to the hole, and the green had a 12 degrees slant away from the box. It was very easy to overshoot. I took a wedge, just trying to get close. The ball hit the edge of the green and very, very slowly rolled to the hole, trickling in just before it stopped. The other guys were giving the judge grief for bringing in a ringer, but we grinned the whole time. In the history of the course, there had only been five holes in one before me. I reflected, as we sat in the clubhouse, on how much being a member here was costing me. I had to stay in rounds over the fish and now over the hole in one. The place was pretty loud and then suddenly got quiet when Monica and Bonnie returned from their afternoon. I reflected that they were worth every dime I'd spent. They may have been mature ladies, but they certainly made an impression. Bonnie's hair had lost its color, hanging in shiny ropes on her shoulders and touching the light gray silk sheath she was wearing. Her shoes matched the gray of her dress, and her eyes were done in a smoky hue that accentuated them. Monica wore a wraparound dress in vivid red with tiny white polka dots. It barely reached her knees, and the style was a little open at the front, revealing glimpses of her figure as she walked. Her hair was three shades lighter with highlights that glimmered like reflected sun, and her makeup was flawless. She threw her arms around my neck, and I tried to keep her from crying so her makeup wouldn't be ruined. Bonnie just grinned, and when Monica let go, she jumped into my arms. The kiss she gave me was enthusiastic, and the judge laughed as she dabbed my face to remove the lipstick. She leaned in and whispered, I got my very first wax today, and for the first time in my life, I'm wearing a thong. It's as uncomfortable as hell, but it makes my hips look great. All I need is a couple of bite marks, and it would be perfect. I'm sure the judge will take care of that as soon as you show him what's under that dress. Damn right he will. He might need to take two little blue pills tonight if Monica's daughter doesn't work out. I have two granddaughters who are almost as attractive. Say the word, and I'll introduce you. Can I have them both? She giggled, if you can handle them. They're twins. I grinned, wondering what she'd think if she knew it wouldn't be the first time I'd had twins in my bed. Monica smiled all the way to her house. Thank you, Jason. I needed it today. Things have been a little stale lately for me and Rob. Too much information, Monica. One look at you now should wake him up. Did you notice how many looks you got? She smiled. Yes, I did. All for men like the judge. You obviously weren't paying attention. I had two men who I'm pretty sure weren't in their 40s yet ask if you were single or if we were in a serious relationship. When the caddy came in to collect his foursome, he was so distracted looking at you and Bonnie that the men had to push him out the door. She flushed and then laughed. I feel so alive. Rob better take some vitamins tonight. He was up early. Don't wait, jump in as soon as you get home. When was the last time you enjoyed a romantic interlude in the middle of the day? Not since Pine was two. This empty nest thing might just work out. Then, she grinned, that doesn't mean I'm opposed to grandchildren. The beauty of grandchildren is you can spoil them rotten, pour sugar into them, and then call mom and dad to pick them up. I'm hoping I get to do that soon. I'm not getting any younger. You couldn't prove it by me. When we arrived, Rob and Pauline were waiting by the door, no doubt ready to regale us with fish stories. But when Monica got out of the car and seemed to glide across the driveway, both of them lost their train of thought. 
She kissed Pauline on the cheek and gave Rob a kiss, then told him, You smell like fish, honey. Go on up to the shower while I say goodbye to the children. I'll be up to wash your back. He stood for a moment before bolting through the door, calling his goodbyes over his shoulder. Monica hugged us both and pushed us out the door. Pauline had little to say for most of the drive, then she grinned. All right, what did you do to mom? I played a round of golf with her, then another round with Judge Adler while she took advantage of the spa. I think she needed reminding that she was still a beautiful and desirable woman, a fact your father is rediscovering just about now. If the old saying about how you can tell how your wife will look in 20 years by looking at her mother is true, you're going to be one very attractive grandmother. She positively glowed. Marta wasn't smiling when I showed up for work Monday. You sure about this, boss? Sure about what? My little island goddess. She colored up nicely and almost giggled before composing her face again. Pauline, are you sure she's a good choice? I'm not just saying that because you're supposed to be mine. I'm saying it because of her history. She's already bragging about the house you two will live in, and she's getting someone to investigate you. You know this how? The pan sounds like some sort of secret organization. It is. It stands for the Personal Assistant Network. We talk, and a lot of it is about you. Before you say it, we never betray the trust of our bosses, but everybody is pretty much fair game, and most of what we talk about is public knowledge. A couple of the girls really don't like her at all. Good information to have. Do they know about our future? Of course they do. Beverly and Shannon have gotten spells and potions as well. Well, management better watch out. Noted. Now, can we get some actual work done? We spent most of the day planning for a trade show we were attending. We were going to roll out some new products and do a lot of networking. The team I had put together was going down two days before a set up. Marta and I were flying in the night before, and between all of us, the booth would be manned while Marta and I networked with the big names. Just before we left for the day, Marta took my hands in hers, and there were tears in her eyes. Mona told me you were going to marry her, that she was going to break your heart, and that after you'd cleared your head, fate would put us together again. I want you to know I think you're worth waiting for, even if it does break my heart. Then she cheered up. Angelique, our second daughter, we'll call her Angel for short. I hugged her sadly. You are a very complex woman, Marta. You tell me I'm going to marry a woman who will break my heart, then tell me the name of our second daughter. It just occurred to me, would I even get any say in their names? Her dazzling smile showed through. Not the first three. Sile has already seen them. She says Angel will be a blonde and look a lot like her grandmother. She says you get to name the next two. Well, thank you for that consideration. How did you know my mother was a blonde? I didn't until she told me about the hair. Then I looked her up. She's a very lovely woman. That gave me a lot to think about on the drive home. Three weeks later, after a rousing round of intimacy, as we lay in post-intimacy bliss, I asked Pauline a question. Did the investigators find anything interesting in my background? Anything you want to ask me about? She stiffened and sat up. How did you know? I wasn't about to expose Marta. Most of the people you talked to are still my friends. It didn't occur to you that one might let me know someone was poking around? That part was true. Five different people had called, including Leslie and Carmela. Even more had been concerned and passed their thoughts along through others. I called the girls right after Marta had told me, and they warned everyone else, so the investigators learned very little that wasn't public knowledge. Your friends seemed to be very loyal. I think the whole thing became a game to them. They told the investigators all kinds of wild tales about you or just smiled and walked away. Even in bars and restaurants, they seemed to know who the investigators were. Then they started playing games, having their rental cars towed, using computers to check them out of their lodgings, reporting their credit cards as stolen. The whole thing was very frustrating for them. Two gave up in disgust and quit. Then she smiled. They did talk to one model who was very unflattering about you. A little digging brought to light that it was just sour grapes after you ended things with her. What did she do that would make you get rid of someone that attractive? Beauty isn't always just on the outside. 
We made promises, and she broke them. Very few people ever get second chances with me. She stiffened a little. Are you angry with me? Not really. You could have just asked your father. He had me checked out pretty thoroughly, and I told my friends to be honest with him. You know he would never have shared that. There are lines he won't cross, and business is kept completely apart from personal matters. I've decided it doesn't matter and that we each have to take each other at face value. Good thinking. If one of us does something, the truth always finds a way to come out. All that being said, I think we should go to the next level. I haven't been seeing anyone else, but if you have, we need to make this exclusive. Do you agree? She nearly threw me out of the bed with the way she responded. I haven't been with anyone since three months before we met. You're the only one for me. How exclusive? Dating exclusive or cohabitating exclusive? I smiled at her enthusiasm. Dating for now. If we don't get derailed, the next step will come shortly. This train isn't coming off the tracks. French Enterprises was starting to get a lot of attention thanks to my public relations work, our trade show booths, and our charitable endeavors. I had worked out a deal with Rob that had him sending his more promising employees to community college, paid for by the company. We had eight in the program and 20 more applications in the months that followed. Pauline and I drew closer. Leslie and Carmela were still cautious but accepting. I had moved out of their condo and gotten one of my own. Pauline was living with me full-time by then, and we were very happy. On our one-year anniversary, she surprised me by dropping to one knee and proposing. It's been a year since we moved in together. If I haven't proven myself by now, we have no future. If that's true, it will break my heart, but I'll move out immediately. I grinned and pulled the box out of my pocket. Well then, it looks like I need to seal the deal. Pauline Amanda French will absolutely, yes. Hell yes. Now put that ring on my finger. When we made the announcement, her parents seemed happier than we did. Marta had been getting more and more withdrawn, and when the announcement came out, she put in her notice. I tried to talk her out of it, but she was adamant. I can't stay here and watch you get hurt, no matter how much I love you. You remember this, Jason Grant Holston, even if you don't see it now, I'm still destined to be your soulmate. You won't hear from me, but I'll be keeping an eye on you. I really hope it lasts and you find happiness. She was gone. We had been married a year and a half. Pauline was 32, not in the danger zone, but the window was closing, so I brought up the subject of children. I was surprised when she hesitated. We're still young. Let's enjoy a few more years before we settle down. As far as I'm concerned, we are settled down. Your clock might not be ticking, but mine is. Think about it, will you? Things were a little uneasy for a while before we fell back into our patterns. Pauline had to travel a few days a month, usually just day trips and back before bedtime. Once a month, she was at a facility two states away, so she stayed overnight and packed as much work as she could into the two days. I would go with her when I could, but I had my own set of responsibilities, so I gradually let her go on her own. I'd catch her staring vacantly out the window and wondered if she was thinking about children. It seemed high time to revisit that discussion. Then I ran into Bob's wife at a restaurant. I really didn't remember her, but when she introduced herself, I invited her to share my table. Her husband had streamlined the supply chains and all the plants, and his cost-saving methods did not go unnoticed. Rob had given him a car as a bonus, a Cadillac SUV with all the bells and whistles. Gina immediately took it away from him, declaring it the perfect family vehicle. We talked about her husband, the car, and she showed me pictures of her three kids. I told her I hoped that soon I'd have a photo or two to share. She looked at me oddly. That's good, Jason. It seems you're recovering very well. When I heard you were separated, I thought your marriage was over. I'm glad you worked out your problems. My instincts kicked in, and I kept my voice neutral. Thank you, Gina. Not many people knew about the separation. How did you find out? I'm sorry, but it's pretty common knowledge at the Jefferson plant, especially after she dated Robert Sinclair. They were pretty hot and heavy for a while, but then it cooled. I'm glad. 
he was a bit of a player. We ended lunch, and she caught my mood. I'm sorry if I brought up old hurts, Jason. Bob thinks the world of you and says you're one of the best things to happen to the company in a long while. I kissed her cheek. Don't upset yourself, Gina. It's all water under the bridge now. Tell Bob I said hi. I thought about it for a little, then decided to investigate. If it was all rumors and gossip, I'd let it go. If there was even the slightest amount of truth in what Gina had said, my future with Pauline would be over. Looking through my old contacts, I found the number I wanted. Fred Johnson wasn't a private detective, he was a security consultant with a global company I had used from time to time in my old career. I gave him a call, and we caught up for a minute. Freddy, this isn't a social call. I have a target I need investigated, and it's urgent. I'll send a dossier and photos within the hour. Spare no effort on this and take a month. She travels, and I want a full picture. Can you do it? Of course I can, my friend. She'll have four people on her around the clock starting next week. How detailed do you want this? Should we hack her electronics? Absolutely. I want everything, phone calls, emails, texts, the works. Take a lot of pictures, especially if she seems to be up to something. I have to ask if this is business or personal. There was a long silence. All right. I'm sorry, my friend. Don't be. There may be nothing to worry about, but I'd rather know than not know. Thanks, Fred. The next month was difficult for me. Pauline caught on and asked if I was all right. I attributed it to stress from work, and she stayed pretty close to me. Neville called at the end of the month. There's really nothing to report. She went to work, then home, or her hotel room. She never spent any inappropriate time with anyone. However, she seems to have had a romance at one of the plants she visited a few months ago. It went hot and heavy for three months and then stopped. It's all hearsay and we have no proof, just what we overheard from the office workers. Also, her lover bragged about being with the wife of a hot shot from the home plant. Mostly, though, I'm concerned about what my operatives heard in a restaurant. Let me play you the conversation. An unknown voice came on, a woman. So, hon, how's the love life? Pauline was instantly recognizable. As good as it gets with the hubby. He really is a good lover. That's it. You're not playing anymore? I didn't say that. Jason was giving me a strange vibe this month, so I've been a good girl just in case he suspects anything. I doubt he'd have me investigated, but better safe than sorry. I'll give it another month to cool down, then I think I'll play until January. That's when I'm going off the pill and starting our family. That was all I needed to hear. The investigation was costing me roughly $150,000 a month, but I considered it money well spent and I could afford it. Pauline lasted another five weeks, then she was involved with a customer during one of her day trips, working until noon and then spending the afternoon with him. I had video and audio of the entire situation and should have acted then, but morbid curiosity got the best of me. She was also involved with an employee of the company on another trip and picked up a random stranger at a bar on an overnight stay, spending the night with him until just before checkout. I thought about how to handle it and decided that a picture was worth a thousand words. I printed out a still from each of her encounters and included a few texts and emails that were particularly revealing. I laid a note on top of it, don't contest the divorce. I know you chose lovers who were married so they wouldn't talk. Their wives will be getting these pictures and more tomorrow. Let's not let this become too much of a public spectacle. Think about your parents and the company and don't let the mud splash onto them. I'll be gone when you get back. I'm not running away, but I think it might be a very bad idea if we're in close proximity right now. Don't call, don't text, you'll be wasting your time. I visited Rob, telling him I had a family emergency and would be going back to England for a week or so. He was a good man and immediately offered his help if I needed it. I handed him the report on Pauline and asked him to read it after I left. It was just a document without pictures, I didn't want him or Monica to see something they couldn't forget. I realized as I boarded the plane that the person I regretted hurting the most was Monica. We had become very close, and she was always over at the condo. 
Pauline used to laugh and remind her mother that I was married to her, not the other way around. Monica always laughed and said she was glad Pauline saw me first. She spent a lot of time talking about baby names and had already decorated a nursery in her house, painting it a neutral color. Pauline looked at it with both parents. Mom, Monica grinned, you're not getting any younger, you know. Best to be prepared. Now I was on a plane out of their lives. It wasn't like the situation hit the fan, it was more like a waste treatment plant exploding. Pauline got home from her day trip and, after we landed in New York to transfer, I watched her on video as she came through the door. Jason, honey, where are you? What a day I've had. I just want to relax, sip some wine, and snuggle. We'll order in. I saw her looking puzzled because my car was still in the garage. She went to the living room first, then the bedroom, and then the kitchen. When she reached the dining room, she saw the packages and idly picked one up. Her scream must have been loud, as it came through clearly. Then she surprised me by fainting. I texted Monica, asking her to come over as quickly as she could, and 20 minutes later she arrived. The door wasn't locked, but even if it had been, she had a set of keys. By then, Pauline was sitting on the sofa, staring into space. She wasn't crying, just sitting there, completely blank. Monica tried several times to get her to talk before calling 911. While she waited, she reached down and picked up some papers, then gasped, and her own tears started. Rob showed up a few minutes later with a look of thunder on his face. One glance at his daughter turned that into one of concern. Pauline spent three days in the hospital being evaluated and treated for shock. I felt bad when I found out about it, but not much. She had tried calling me every opportunity she had, and I let it all go to voicemail. I also didn't answer texts or emails. Then Monica called. Hi mom, how are you? Jason, honey, I'm so sorry. Pauline had a breakdown and spent three days at the hospital. She's with us now so we can watch her. Is there any way? Her voice trailed off, realizing the futility of the question. Nope, none. This wasn't a one-time slip. She's been with at least five different men in the last 14 months, all while I was begging her to start a family. This goes a lot deeper than I think any of us realized. I urge you to get her a counselor. She was crying brokenly, and I felt really sad for her. I tried to soothe her from 4,000 miles away, and she finally stopped. Tell Rob I'm sorry. I'll be resigning within the month, and I'll be back in a few days to wrap up some projects and hopefully spend some time with my successor. Make it clear to Pauline that she is not to contact me, speak to me, or come anywhere near me. If she does, the resignation will become immediate, and I'll leave. I understand. We're really going to miss you. I'm going to miss you as well. It was like having a second set of parents, and I loved every minute of it. Monica, I don't want you or Rob to take any blame for this. I'm pretty sure you didn't do anything wrong in bringing up Pauline. She needs to find out what triggers this behavior and overcome it. I have to go now. I'll see you in a few days. When I spilled my tale of woe to my mother at her country estate, she tried to be sympathetic, but I had the feeling she had never liked Pauline and wasn't terribly upset that we had parted. I spent two days with her before moving to a villa in Tuscany owned by mom's new significant other. No one knew about the connection, and it would be the perfect place to isolate for a few days. That was my plan until Lizzie and Carmela showed up two days later, and I got the same feeling from them as I did from my mother. I asked them to tell me the truth. Carmela sighed. There was something inherently unstable in her makeup you weren't trained to notice, but I got glimpses of it from time to time. I had a long talk with her about your opinion of monogamy, and she said she was in total agreement. But the way she moved her eyes and her body language said she wasn't quite sure about it. You say she may go into counseling? That's an excellent idea. I hope whoever her counselor is digs until they find the root cause of her instability. If they do, they can move forward. Lizzy was a little more blunt. I never liked her. I knew she would break your heart. Instead of offending me, it made me smile. If your friends ever reached the point that they couldn't tell you the truth, then that friendship was in deep trouble. Looking back, I can see how everyone close to me had tried gently to show what they saw, but I was so in love I didn't understand. 
You know, you're one of the most intuitive people I've ever met, until it comes to romantic entanglements. I suggest if there's a next time, you be a bit more pragmatic. Sage advice, Carmela. I probably won't take it. Some sort of character flaw, I guess, but I'll work on it. What are you going to do now? I don't know. I probably won't stay in Ohio, but beyond that, everything is up in the air. There's nothing wrong with Ohio. Spoken like a true Buckeye. You could go back to your old company, it's yours after all. Michael is on the verge of a breakdown. The stress he has to deal with is getting to him, only because he hasn't learned to tell those to shut up and do their jobs. Models are like doctors, they're mostly narcissistic and have a god complex. Lizzie exploded with laughter, and Carmela frowned. I strove to correct my mistake. The exception is you, soon to be Dr. Carmela. Nice save, Jay-Z. I know what you meant. To a great degree, it's true. That's why you're so good at what you do. You know exactly when to lend a sympathetic ear or give a sharp kick in the butt. They listen to you because you keep their best interests at heart. They know they can trust you with their secrets and their lives if it came to it. There's been a bit of a vacuum since you moved on. It's time to come back and fill it. You have to admit it would keep you from getting bored. I wasn't bored with what I was doing. It felt good to have average people around me for a change. Know what I discovered? The difference was nothing really. They had their own set of traumas and hardships, the same dreams and ambitions. They may have been more modest and muted, but they were there. They were just as prone to jealousy, anger, retribution, infidelity, or any other emotion as supermodels, business magnates, or artists. But they mostly had better grounding. A $5,000 raise meant just as much as a $5 million contract in their eyes, and some would do anything to get it. So you're saying everybody sucks? Yes and no. What I'm saying is we're all pretty much the same, creatures of habit and environment. Damn, Jess. Maybe you should get your own PhD. Not bad for someone whose specialty used to make the beautiful look even more so. I shrugged and opened another bottle of Andre's excellent wine. I got back ten days later and returned to my condo, wondering if it would be empty. It was. On the same dining table where I had left my evidence was a simple letter. I don't know if you're coming back or if you'll ever read this, if you do, but I want to tell you a few things. First, I'm sorry I betrayed you. I really do love you as much as I can grasp the concept of love. I know on a basic level why I did the things I did, I just can't understand why I keep repeating them. I have a feeling you were my last chance at happiness, and I destroyed that pretty thoroughly. I've had a session a day for the last week with a really expensive counselor, thanks to my parents, and he seems to think I'm afraid of real life, his words, not mine. Me, the pampered princess daughter of one of the richest men in the state, who has almost always gotten what she wanted since she was six, afraid of common things like commitment and children. Especially children. He said in our last session that I was probably the most spoiled person he's ever met. I told him about you, and he looked you up. I saw most of what he had, and he must have had better investigators, or your friends thought it really didn't matter now, but he had quite a different opinion of you. He said your reputation as a hard-nosed businessman was well known in the business, as well as your efforts to do the absolute best for whoever you worked with, and your generosity with your friends. I know you'll never forgive me, and if I thought I had any chance at all of getting you back, I'd beg on my knees in front of everyone for you to take me back. Instead of the drama, I'm giving you a gift. Get a lawyer, write up a fair divorce, and I'll sign it when my lawyer looks it over. You keep what's yours, I'll keep what's mine, and we'll join the ranks of the once married. I will tell you that I took a few things from the condo that had meaning to me, not valuable items, just things that held fond memories. If you see something missing that you wanted, just let my lawyer know. I won't fight over whatever it is, and we'll return it. I know it isn't much, but that's all I can offer. I'll always love you, always regret what I did, and wish you a happy life. Think of me from time to time, happy memories, and smile. I will. She didn't sign it. She didn't have to. I was in Rob's office the next day, and he had a look of profound sadness. I was really hoping this was the one. Monica and I have grown to love you like the son we always wanted. She's still crying. 
Maybe you can take her to lunch, or better yet, have dinner with us. I know you want to leave, but please reconsider. I had visions of turning the business over to you and Pauline in five years or so and retiring early, taking Monica on a world cruise or long vacation, then coming home to spoil the grandkids. You would have made an excellent CEO. I doubt Pauline will ever be ready to take the reins. I'll probably sell the businesses when I'm tired of running them. Rob, I'll always be grateful for the job you gave me and the trust you had in me, but it's time to move on. I'm sure you knew my answer and are already looking. I hope I'm around long enough to help you, but in 30 days, I'm moving to Europe, at least for a while. I looked up at his fish photo and smiled. The girls aren't moving, and they'll need a fishing buddy, so I'm sure they'll stay in touch. Make sure Monica keeps playing golf and pay the attention to her she deserves. She stood by you during the long hours and missed celebrations while you built your business, and now it's time to pay it back. Monica cried when I came over for dinner almost constantly, but both Rob and I were understanding, and she actually smiled there at the end. I took her to lunch a couple of times and teased her as J.I. drooled over her from afar. Rob and I fished twice more on Holloway Mountain before I left. I sat on the plane and wondered how he would like my goodbye gift. I had arranged for a membership to the club, paying five years in advance. When they were approved, they should be getting the acceptance letter any time now. I had a visitor two days before I left. I'd already gotten my PA reassigned to a good man and was just tidying up when I heard the knock. It was Bob, and he had a sad smile on his face. I wanted to talk to you before you left. I'm probably the only one in Ohio who can understand how you feel. She broke my heart, and I didn't make it to the marriage. Gina says I shouldn't hold a grudge, but I still have unresolved issues I keep buried. That's not what I wanted to talk about. I want to talk about Gina. She brought me around and showed me that true love was still possible. Seven years in, and I'm still convinced she walks on water. You're a good man, Jason. Your Gina is out there somewhere. May good luck follow you in your life from now on. And just like that, he was gone. It did make me feel better. Eighteen months went by. I spent a month at the Tuscan Villa, soaking up solitude and healing. I started out small, but soon I was back in the driver's seat of my old company. I never sold it, I just turned the day-to-day -day operations over to my subordinates while I went off and played at being a middle manager. I dated after a few months, and with my looks, wealth, and business connections, I had women interested in me. It was fun, and getting sweaty with models was enjoyable, but usually by the fourth date, they realized I wasn't ready to commit. The ones who wanted substance faded away, while those who just wanted to have a good time stayed in my orbit. Still, empty fun is better than no fun. Carmela came to me with a business deal. She wanted to buy a minority share of my business and give it to Lizzie, something she was familiar with and hopefully wouldn't require a lot of training. I thought about it and agreed, selling her 10% with an option to buy 15% more over the next five years. After that, Whenever we did a shoot together, Lizzy wore two hats, model and businesswoman. Carmela and I had coached her, and she had developed far beyond the shy beauty she had been when she first started. We contracted with a sports magazine to do a swimsuit spread, pretty run-of-the-mill stuff until we ran into a problem. A young model, just 18, found out she wasn't getting the cover and became a big problem. She disrupted two days of shooting, and in most businesses, especially ours, time is money. Lizzie was handling it, and she called me outlining what she was going to do. It sounded like so much fun, I dropped what I was doing and flew out to the island location. I got there just in time to make the meeting between Lizzie, the model, and her agent. I carried a manila envelope with me, sliding it over to Lizzie. She peeked in and grinned. The agent started the meeting with the hope that we could work things out, mentioning that the model's stunning natural beauty should ensure her the cover and expressing confusion over why we were being so difficult. Lizzy exploded, natural beauty? There's hardly anything natural about your client. She's had a nose job, a hairline adjustment to remove a pronounced widow's peak, her cheekbones have been shaved, and her lips thinned. I understand she's planning some chin work after the shoot. So, tell me, where's this natural beauty you go on about? She opened the envelope, and a photo spilled out of the model when she was 13, her mouth full of braces, wearing thick glasses, 
with thick hair almost to her eyebrows, a pronounced nose, and a chubby face. The model took one look and fainted. She was American, and in several countries where beauty is big business, it's often a safe assumption that a flawless appearance is quite different from how someone looked in their early years. Lizzie drove her point home. Regardless of how your client got her beauty, she is still an exceptionally attractive woman. This shoe will be good for her career, and maybe in a year or two she'll have a cover. It won't be this year. When your client wakes up, tell her that if she isn't on that beach ready to work by noon today, not to bother. I'll replace her in a second. I already have two on standby hoping she stays difficult. You should also let her know that her misbehavior will get around and good shoots will be a little harder for her to come by, particularly with this company. Is this matter settled? I thought the agent was going to break his neck the way it was bobbing. We walked out while he woke her and explained how the real world worked. Models are commodities, like wheat or corn. If they're moldy or unfit for use, their value and availability go way down. The sooner the models learn this, the better off they are. I have to say, the newer models are a lot savvier and better educated than 10 or 15 years ago, probably because they view it as what it is, a business. Lizzie grinned when I told her how well she did. I didn't even have to mention the vision surgery or the ear tags. There's probably not one thing that's original equipment on that girl. Can you hang around for a day or so? I have a surprise for you. I can stay until tomorrow afternoon, then I have to meet the crew for some snow shots in the Arctic Circle. Lizzie shivered. I remember my first one. I nearly froze to death. Have you got the soundproof room set up yet? It'll be right behind the cameras. We'll shoot for a minute tops before we hustle them into the warmth. Nothing motivates you to get it right quite like sub-freezing temperatures. Carmela flew in, and I entertained her with stories about how tough her lover had turned into. She just smiled and hugged her tighter. We shared a sweet night, Lizzie had rented a place, and spent a nice evening talking about old times. We went fishing with Rob the last time we were home. Monica still tears up at the mention of you. They can't get over you giving them a membership. They deserved it. It was also a nice thing you did, flying them over to visit you and your mother, as well as her new husband at his villa. He seems like a good man. He is. He lost his son in Afghanistan early in the war when the English were still heavily involved, and his daughter died of an accidental overdose at a party. He was pretty lonely until he met mom. I've seen the pictures. You're the closest thing he has to a son left. You should have heard Monica when she talked about how impatient they were getting for grandchildren. It's still a bit early to walk that road again. I still have faith the right one will show up. I thought about their grins as I dropped off to sleep. They were up to something, something that turned out to be about 5T. Nothing of island goddess. Marta came up behind me, wondering why the girls had wanted her to come here. She had become friends with them, and they supported the literary project she headed on her home island. They had five schools going, and they existed solely on donations. I sent a hefty sum twice a year, and I knew the girls had talked their friends into helping out. Thanks to their combined efforts, 220 children got an education, enough to eat, and clean clothes to wear. Marta hired the best parents for support roles, cooking the meals, maintaining the buildings, and providing transportation, everything it took to keep the schools running. They hired the very best teachers and paid them well. Their second set of high school seniors were going to graduate soon. She saw who was sitting with them, let out a shriek that let everyone on the island know she was there, and plowed into me so hard we both went down in the sand. The girls had huge grins on their faces as they helped us up. When I sat down, Marta sat in my lap and refused to move. After about the fortieth kiss, I managed to pry her lips off me to tell her how happy I was to see her. I've missed you, my little island goddess, I said. I know the priest keeps me informed. Oh, before I forget, she pulled out a little vial and dusted it across my hair and shoulders. What was that? I asked. The remainder of the love potion I've been carrying for almost four years. You'll never get away now. I looked down at her beautiful face and had the thought that maybe I wouldn't try so hard this time. A year later, I was standing under a bower in a garden in Tuscany, waiting for my bride. There were many models there, most friends, and a few who wanted to see what kind of woman had finally captured my heart. 
the string quartet started playing canon in D, and she appeared in a lace and satin gown, with a wreath of pearls and lace around her face. She held tightly to the arm of the man escorting her. I had invited Rob and Monica, and they surprised me by coming. They had become friends with my mother and my new stepfather and visited each other twice a year. When Monica met Marta and found out her parents had passed in a plane crash, she stepped in, performing mother of the bride duties. Rob decided if Monica was doing that, it was his duty to present the bride. When the priest asked who gave the bride, his voice could be heard clearly, Monica and I. My best man grinned hugely. Carmela wore an elegant tuxedo that matched mine but left no doubt a woman was wearing it. Lizzie was decked out in a pink creation as Marta's maid of honor. As the sun set on a glorious Tuscan day, with the scent of fresh grapes and new-mown hay hanging in the air, Marta and I became one. I lifted the sheer veil from her beautiful face and share our first kiss as husband and wife. I felt her tiny body against me and imagined I could feel a baby bump, though she was only two months along. The reception lasted long into the night. The last sight I saw as I took my bride upstairs was of Carmela and Lizzie snug together in a slow dance. Mom and Nigel were just past them, then Rob and Monica. Everyone was a bit hung over the next morning and a little slow, but when Marta announced that our first child would be arriving sometime in late March, the mood got festive again. I'd flown in two uncles from my father's side, along with their wives, two cousins, and their husbands. My grandfather wanted to come, but his health wasn't that good. Marta promised him we would visit within the month. Six weeks later, we were in the mountains of North Carolina in a big farmhouse. My grandfather was quite taken with the little goddess. The cousins, uncles, and aunts didn't know quite what to make of us, but they warmed up quickly. I took Marta on a few walks along the streams and fields of my childhood. She surprised me with a request, will you buy us a vacation home here? I showed her the 80 acres I'd inherited from my father. There was a modest house there, and I had a cousin living in it and taking care of the property. Marta wasn't interested in it, she pointed to a bench halfway up a mountain. I want a log cabin there. Her idea of a log cabin and mine were completely different. Mine had an open floor plan, and hers had two stories and six bedrooms. Guess which one got built? The first time we spent the night in it, I knew one of these days we'd come and never leave. Marta traveled with me in her old position as personal assistant until she got close to her due date. I purposely handed off all my business to my partner Lizzie starting two weeks before the expected date and a month afterwards. Jason Jr. was an easy berth according to the doctor and nurses, but I still shuddered at how much pain it caused Marta. I wasn't sure I wanted her to experience that again. When I told her my thoughts, she stood as tall as her 41 and a half inches would let her and gave me an earful. I never brought it up again. Two years later, Maria joined us, and the year after that, it was Angelique. I was ready to stop, but Marta got that expression on her face that told me we'd stop when she was ready to stop. The next year, the twins arrived, and Marta finally said enough and closed the baby factory. I got a help name for the boy, Andre Robert, after my stepfather and Rob. The girl was named Tiny Little Ashley Monica, after my mother. Monica would grow up to be an almost exact duplicate of Marta, down to her size. She'd always be the baby of the family, and her size may have had something to do with it. Both sets of grandparents dote on the children. Monica picked out a small villa near my mother, and they bought it. An event had made Rob re-examine his life goals, and he sold his businesses for a nice piece of change and retired. They lived in Ohio for a bit before relocating to Tuscany. I walked in one day to see them holding the twins while my mother and stepfather grinned at me. When Monica caught me staring, she said, your children are the closest we're ever going to get to being grandparents. Get used to having us around. Both sets of grandparents went house shopping and found them a property less than 10 miles away. They moved in over the next few months after the repairs and modifications they wanted to the house were done. I came by one day to find Monica sitting in a rocking chair, holding my youngest daughter, with tears in her eyes as she looked at a photo of Pauline. Rob called me one night in a panic. Jason, can you come? Something's happened. I heard a great deal of pain in his voice, and my first thoughts were of Monica. Is everything alright? No, Pauline died last night. They would tell me snippets about her life from time to time. 
she continued to see her therapist regularly and seemed much improved. Three years later, she remarried and was very happy for a couple of years. There was even talk of trying for a child, even though she was almost 40. Then she caught him cheating twice. The third time, she started divorce proceedings. The man thought he was going to get a gold mine in the split, but everything important was still in Rob's name. They ended up selling the house and splitting the proceeds, and Pauline had to pay alimony for three years. The day after the divorce was final, Rob fired him. He tried to take Pauline back to court, but his lawyer told him it would go nowhere fast and cost him a good bit. He left the area, and no one cared where he went. Pauline went into a downward spiral of depression. She told Monica it was cosmic revenge for what she'd done to most of the men in her life, and she just had to accept it. A year later, she seemed to be coming around, but then she didn't show up for work for two days. Monica couldn't get her on the phone, so she went to her house and found her on the floor. There were no drugs in her system other than the normal amount of her prescriptions, and the autopsy showed it to be a heart attack. No one could explain it because she was in fairly good health. Marta and I helped make the arrangements. There were a lot of people at her funeral, many from the charity organization she had sponsored. Most were there to express their condolences, but a couple wanted to make sure the money kept flowing. By the look in Rob's eyes, I had the feeling the company sponsorship for those organizations would be coming to an end shortly. Bob and his wife Gina were there, and we talked a bit at the wake. It's a shame, he said. She was rich, beautiful, and had a charmed life, except for her romantic struggles. I talked to her about six months ago, and she seemed to be on the mend, talking about a new program I started to allow materials to flow more freely. She seemed really upbeat. I hope she was happy there at the end. So did I. She was only 43 when she passed. I wondered what her last thoughts were, if she had time, what she regretted, and what had given her joy. Rob and Monica carried on for a while, but the joy was out of their lives. Then we had the twins, and the decision was made. Ten years later, when Rob was almost 75, he and Monica invited us over for a talk. We're getting old, son. Our time on this earth is about over. We've talked it over, our will has been updated, and I don't want to hear any arguments. The kids will get half our estate, with Marta as executor. Between your parents and your businesses, they'll never want for money, but we want them to have it. The rest will be in a charitable trust, the Pauline French Foundation. You two will be on the board of directors. What could we say? Monica went first two years later, and Rob puttered around like an old engine slowly running out of gas before he followed her. Nine months later, we flew back to Ohio to lay him to rest beside his wife in the same cemetery that held both their parents and Pauline in a family plot. Andre and Mom went shortly afterwards. Andre had left us a letter saying how much he'd enjoyed having a family again after his children had passed and how the kids had kept them alive. I did part of his eulogy and talked about how lucky I was to have two excellent fathers over the course of my life when so many never got to experience that joy, while Mom wept softly in Marta's arms. When Mom passed, and the will was read, we were stunned. We had no idea what Andre was worth, and Mom had an estate worth three million dollars. We got the estate in England, the villa in Tuscany, and some very valuable commercial property in four countries. After the proper taxes were paid, we still had an amount in the tens of millions. So Marta and I retired. We still kept busy. Marta continued to sponsor her schools, but now that she had serious money, she expanded it to three times the former size. I took over the administration of the foundation. There's a large painting of Pauline in her thirties, elegant and smiling, that hangs in the entrance way of the building that houses the charity, along with lesser portraits of Rob, Monica, Andre, and Mom. I'd commission the paintings as a tribute to them. May they all rest in peace. We lived in Tuscany for another two years, but with everyone gone, the place was haunted with too many memories, so we moved to our cabin. Our cousins go crazy listening to the kids talk. One minute they're speaking perfect French or Italian, the next, it will be Oxford accented English, and the next, they'll be slinging slang around. If they start speaking Haitian Creole, they just walk off. I'm pushing 60 now and look it, while Marta has that ageless beauty that defies time, looking just as radiant at 54 as she did at 34. 
I bet people wonder why she's with someone my age. She says it's because I may as well be made of money and my vitality is still going strong. I commissioned a renowned painter who had specialized in animal portraits throughout his career to create portraits of Carmela, Lisi, Marta, and me for the little gallery at the charity headquarters. He had once painted a poignant portrait of two children sledding, capturing the joy on their faces just seconds before their tragic end. It's not publicly shown, but seeing it left me with tears in my eyes, realizing the fleeting nature of their happiness. He also painted a striking picture of his future wife, a successful writer specializing in children's literature, so vividly it seemed she might step right off the canvas. His fee was quite high, but worth it, and I wrote him a check when he quoted the price. I organized my desk and left for the weekend. The kids were at the cabin, along with our five grandchildren and their spouses or partners. It was going to be a full house for our 25th wedding anniversary, and I had a special surprise planned for Marta. I had visited the Creole restaurant, now run by the children, and requested a small vial of white powder. It looked a lot like baking soda or something similar. Whatever it was, it would be part of a special celebration for my wife that evening. I thought of it as a little extra touch to make our anniversary even more memorable. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.